Well, I think the most important thing is what everyone recognizes, which is the business model of commercial journalism is dying and dying rapidly. And I, I think that in the book what we argue is that uh, the internet accelerated the process and has made it permanent but didn't create the process. The process, and I think the evidence is clear, began in earnest uh, at least a quarter century ago and accelerated during the early 1990s. Uh, and the problem ultimately is that uh, there's a conflict between the profit motive and the public service of journalism that became accentuated as news media became concentrated uh, in a small number of hands operating in largely monopolistic markets without direct competition, which made it possible for them to cut back resources to news throughout the 1990s, for example, while getting huge profits and not suffering because there was a competitor offering a better product. And I think that the decline of advertising in particular, which you've already referred to, uh, is, is really something that's crucial because, because of the role of advertising in the last 125 years to provide between 60 and 100 percent of the revenues for news media, it gave us the illusion that the market would always provide all the journalism we needed and that it was a natural free market function. <laughs> and what it did is it really masked the fact that journalism should best be regarded as having important elements of a public good something that the market can't provide effectively for a free society and that the market is really inappropriate to be the sole uh, dispenser of journalism. And now that advertising is leaving, the resources are dwindling, we're left with the stark fact that the market alone is not going to provide the resources to give us sufficient journalism. And that's what we have to face up to. It's got to come from somewhere else. I think that for most of us, and I think for me certainly, and I'm willing to bet every single person in this room, we were raised to think that freedom of the press meant the government should not censor with private media, should not censor what editors do, should not interfere with anyone's ability to start a private medium. And that's absolutely right. That's one half of the American free press tradition, but it's only half of it. The other half of the American free press tradition is that it's the first duty of a democratic state to make sure a free press exists in the first place, that you actually have a fourth estate. Otherwise, the freedom not to have it censored is a hollow freedom if it doesn't exist. And when you look back then at the first 100 years of American press history, prior to the rise of advertising in the late 19th century, what you see is that we had this spectacularly bountiful press system, much larger in a per capita basis than Britain or France or Canada at the same time between 1790 and 1875. And it was significantly there due to massive public subsidies put in place by the federal government, primarily postal but also printing subsidies. So that was how they solved it. They understood it was a public good. There was no notion in the early republic that the market would solve this. You just get out of the way and let entrepreneurs make money and, and the competition to make profit would generate this, a sufficient level, a quality or quantity of journalism for self-government. That was an unthinkable idea until it began to be promoted by businesses when they controlled journalism by the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'll just add one point out of that is of central importance. Uh, in doing our research for this book, we went back and we reread all the major freedom of the press decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court. Because I confess, I honestly thought that, of course, our Supreme Court, and I think probably many of you would have the same thinking now looking at the recent decisions they've been making, certainly the Supreme Court at some point in the last 75 years had said that freedom of the press was meant, the First Amendment was meant, that private businesses should control journalism and that their right to make profit was sacrosanct, and that was the, the be-all, end-all of the First Amendment. And what was striking to me as I reread the great decisions going back to the 1930s, Hugo Black, Potter Stewart, uh, William Douglas, was that in several of them, when the issue came up, they argued that it was the first duty of the democratic state to make sure you had a credible fourth estate. Otherwise, the entire constitutional system wouldn't work. And when I read those opinions in graduate school when I was doing my research, I never paid any attention to them because we had a viable press system. For better or for worse, you might not have liked the content. You might be critical, but we certainly had the resources for credible journalism. But now when you read Hugo Black in 1945 or Potter Stewart in 1971, and they write that, the words jump off the page. Mm. You had the, you know, the argument, in effect, is that the First Amendment not only condones public subsidies of journalism, it demands them. Mm.